Good morning, Harvest. So, about three years ago, I found myself perched on this wooden platform, about 40 feet up in the air, attached to this little thin wire, and I heard this voice behind me saying, three, two, one. I was ziplining for the very first time. So I was out at this confirmation retreat, and all these parents and students were there. And so I was there with my daughter, Emma, my husband, Robert, and we thought, it, wouldn't it be fun for all of us? Like, this is my first time, so wouldn't it be fun if we all zip line together as a family? That's a great idea. So we're all sitting on this platform together. And the funny thing is, as the counselor's behind us counting down, she gets to one, None of us move. <laughs> We're like looking at each other. I'm looking at the wire. Dink, dink, dink. I'm looking down. I'm thinking, uh, and I hear this voice saying, have faith. And I'm just thinking, what exactly am I putting my faith in right now? But I will tell you, okay, first of all, I did get off the ledge. It didn't take that much time. I actually love to zip line now. Um, but one of my favorite things that I have been able to do for the last three years is I have been the pastor that has walked beside our confirmation classes for the last three years. What a joy. Truly, such an amazing time. I have been there at their very first class, handing them the Bible that they're gonna use for this entire time, uh, the whole nine months. I have gone on those retreats with them and done silly things like zip lines and big swings, and I've done silly, goofy games with them. But I have also walked with them on prayer walks, and we have worshiped together, seeing the sun rise up over the lake. And I have seen them open up their Bibles and just delve into scripture to find out who God is and who they are in Christ. And I have laid my hands on them and confirmed them in the faith. And I have prayed over them and I have told them that I love them and I am so proud of them. And we have an amazing confirmation program here. And Mark and I have talked for a while and he has had on his heart for well over a year to have a worship series called Confirmed where he just wanted us to dig into those three main parts that our confirmation students um, study, the faith, roots, and action. And so today we are starting that worship series. It is my joy to be able to kick it off. It's gonna be four weeks. We're gonna talk about faith today and then he'll do roots and action. And on the fourth week, it's going to culminate on Confirmation Sunday. It is going to be such a great series. I hope you are here for the entire time. So today, let's kick off by talking about faith. You know, just a little bitty subject. You know, faith. It's just this little thing. But before we dig into Scripture to talk about it, I want you to hear from some of our amazing confirmation students and let them tell you what they have learned about faith. Watch this. I've experienced my faith in confirmation by I know I can ask God for anything I need, like if I'm having trouble in school and I'm stressed out or having trouble with my friends, I know I can just ask him for anything and he will help me and I can rely on him. What faith looks like to me is just me going through my day and picking the right choices more often than I would have and saying, is this right or is this right? Then rather before, if I just did something and didn't really think about it. I would say I've grown in my faith just like because it used to just be a thing like, oh, I'm going to church now, and it was just kind of there, but now I like really understand it. I have prayed for my friends, like if they are hurt or they are going through a rough time with their family, 
I know I can pray for them and he will help them through their situation. Um, where I've gotten most of my faith is just going to church, confirmation every Sunday. Each person's faith is different and it's their own. And my confirmation group has really helped me through learning about faith and they have taught me about their faith and about loving God more than anything. I'm trying to rely more on Jesus and God more often than I did before. I think it is really important that the parents are part of the confirmation process because I know my parents have been a big help. I think it's important that parents are involved in confirmation. You know, you can always ask a parent for help. I know it's helped me grow, but it's helped many others just like grow closer to their faith and like do better things. My faith was an extension to my parents' faith and it wasn't my own, but going through confirmation, I realized my faith is my own and it's unique and special. Aren't they awesome? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Parents, if you have younger kiddos that are gonna be going through confirmation, oh, it is just amazing. I love this program. But I love that we are starting to talk about faith today. I, you know, I kind of joke that it's this little topic, but I think that the word faith is a lot like the word love. We throw it around and use it just loosely. Like, oh, I love cheesecake, and I love my haircut, and you know, I love my husband. It means different things the way we use. Yes, well, I, and not in that order. I'm, he's not here, so he was in the other one. Maybe I got it right the first time. Anyway, but faith, faith is the same way. We use this word, we throw it around the same way, like when I'm sitting perched on this uh, platform, it's like, yeah, just have faith. Well, what they mean is like, don't think about it, don't reason, just do it, right? Um, or someone might, hey, don't you have faith in me? What they're trying to say is, don't you trust me? I mean, the world uses faith in a lot of different ways, but the church uses the word faith a lot. I mean, faith is the foundation of who we are, what we believe. And you can't turn up the page in the New Testament without landing on a verse about faith. Here are just a few, rapid fire, right? We're saved by grace through faith. We live by faith. We receive righteousness by, we are justified in Christ by, we stand firm in our belief by, we receive the promise of the Spirit by, we do God's work by, and we wait for the return of Christ by faith, right? We have, faith is so important. And then even as good Christians, we ask questions like, do you have enough faith? How big is your faith? Do you think maybe you just need a little more faith? But my problem with that is that we ask the questions, and I don't think we mean to, but we make this impression as if faith and how much we have and what it can do rests solely on, on who we are as if it's this thing, this treasure that's hidden out there and we're supposed to have the clues and find our way to it like we're geocaching. Or that it's this little seed that's been gifted to us and we have to plant it and water it and fertilize it. And, and it's up to us alone to figure out how to make our faith grow bigger. So I don't think we mean to, but I think that we're asking the wrong questions. I think the question that we need to ask is, who is the object of your faith? Now there's a, a scripture in the Bible that everyone goes to when they want to find out, well, what is faith? And it's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. And it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Well, it sounds like a definition, but it's a little confusing. So what you really need to do is know the context of this passage. The book of Hebrews it was a letter that was written 
to um, Jewish Christians. They were Jewish, that they grew up in the Jewish culture and they uh, lived in the temple system. So they learned God's law and his rules. And so they knew what they could eat and what they couldn't eat, um, what they could touch and what they couldn't touch. They learned how, they, how many times they had to go to the temple to offer a sacrifice, how many times they had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They were very task oriented and I get that. I'm a goal-oriented person. I like the idea of having a list. Like, I would love to say, Lord, I am all about having big faith. Like, what do I have to do? Give me that checklist and I will check it off. I will do it. Or tell me exactly where that target is and I will hit it. Uh, you know, I just need something to, to look at and some target to go towards. And that's who they were. But as they were hearing firsthand accounts of who Jesus was, their, uh, his teaching, uh, the miracles that he performed, as, he, as they learned that Jesus was the Son of God who came to earth to live fully human, fully divine, that he willingly gave his life for them to have life, they bought into it. They said, yes, we're gonna have faith in him. And so they gave up the temple system, they left what they knew, and they packed their bags and they said, we are on board, because they had also been told that Jesus was coming back soon. That's a message still for us today. So they were ready to go. They left everything, they were bought in to everything that they um, had heard, and they waited. And they waited and they waited. And while they waited, they began to be persecuted. They were mocked. They were suffering. And the life that they thought that they were going to have by follow, being followers of Jesus was not what they were experiencing. And so they began to lose faith. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to them, saying, I understand what's going on here. But let me remind you of who you put your faith in. Let me remind you of who Jesus is and why you don't want to go back, but you want to go forward. They were living in a seeing is believing world. Guess what? We live in a seeing is believing world. We live in a world where we want to be able to tangibly touch the thing that we believe in. We want to have our checklist. We want to have our target. Yes, I know what I need to do to be a good Christian. I am going to learn the Lord's Prayer. I am going to check off my attendance at church. I made sure my name was in that little black book that Mark told me to sign. I signed up for the service project. Yes, because we're the kind of people who, it's just natural to think, okay, if I do this, then God is going to do this. And we make our faith into this cause and effect system. That's not what it's intended to be. Because when Jesus came to the earth, he said, I don't want you to live in a seeing is believing world. I want you to flip that around. Believing is seeing. If you believe in who I am, if you believe in the scriptures that you read, then you're going to see me. Let me show you how this works. If you believe that I am Jehovah Jireh, the God who is described in Genesis 22 as the one who provided the ram for Abraham so that he would have a substitute sacrifice in place of his son. If you believe I am Jehovah Jireh, then you're going to see me provide, even if in your world right now, you're suffering. Loss of a, because of the flood, right? Loss of a job. And yet, Jehovah Jireh still works in our life providing for us. Sometimes providing by meeting a need in completely unexpected ways. Sometimes he provides by sending out his church, his people, um, to go help, to go walk beside someone who's hurting or who has lost. That's Jehovah Jireh. If you believe that I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, 
just as described in Exodus where he says, I am going to heal you and I will not send the diseases on to you as the Egyptians have, but I will heal your people. If you believe in Jehovah Rapha, even if in your world right now, you are suffering sickness, even if you have someone who is suffering from disease, I am still Jehovah Rapha and I can provide healing from you and it might not come in the way you're expecting. Maybe it's healing comfort as the body of Christ comes alongside you and says, you don't have to walk this road alone. We're gonna pray for you and we're gonna walk with you. Maybe it's that healing comfort of the Holy Spirit that pours over you and gives you the peace that passes understanding that is unexplainable. You cannot see it, but you know, you believe in Jehovah Rapha and so you see his hand at work. If you believe that I am Jehovah Roi, the Lord is my shepherd, that I will guide and direct you, that I love you like the great shepherd that is described in Psalm 23, then you're going to see my hand in your life, even if it seems like it is unraveling on the, at the ends like the life that you had uh, determined for yourself is not what you are facing right now, yet Jehovah Rohi is working in your life. He will close doors and he'll open up windows. He will make a path for you that maybe you never expected and would never have seen on your own. And yet you see his hand at work. So Jesus came to say, I want you to live in a believing is seeing world. Know what scriptures say and I know that you will start to see my hand working in your life. There's a woman, she's a a singer, songwriter. She's also an author. Her name's Jennifer Rothschild. So Jennifer, she was growing up, she was one of those little girls that just loved to draw. She loved to color. She always got the biggest box of crayons that you could get. Um, And she colored everything and she um, wanted to be a commercial artist all her life. That was her big dream. And so when she was 12, what she noticed is uh, she began to have some problems with her eyesight. I started out real subtly at first, you know, couldn't really see the combination of the lock, couldn't really read the chalkboard, but it kept getting worse. And by the time she was in ninth grade, the uh, lenses, the glasses that she had, they they stopped um, being able to correct her vision. So she went to a doctor and the doctor had to give her family the bad news. Had to say, you know, you got this disease and it is going to continue to deteriorate your eyesight, and it's gonna end in blindness. She's devastated. She said on the ride home in the car, it was just silent. And the question started stirring in her mind. How am I gonna finish school? How am I ever going to date? How am I going to live out the dream I have for my life? She said when she got home, she went straight into the living room where the piano was. And she sat at the piano, put her hands on the keys, closed her eyes, and for the first time began playing a song by ear. And it was, it is well with my soul a song that still plays in her heart is one of her most favorite songs. And she said, you know, if healing was sufficient, I know God would have provided healing. If deliverance would have been sufficient, God would have provided deliverance. But God let me live with blindness but he also let me live in the sufficiency of his grace. And even though my life is not what I expected it to be, I see God's hand every single day in so many different ways because I believe in the God described in scripture. That's faith. 
confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. And I get that people struggle with faith. I get that. I've had moments in my own life where I have struggled with faith because I'm goal-oriented, because I want to be able to see it, because I want it to be tangible. I mean, that definition of faith can be a little dissatisfying for some people. But here's something that I've learned, and I fully believe. I believe that faith is something you can see. I believe that faith leaves a mark, that faith leaves evidence of where it is in one person's life. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Arizona. I have not, but I've seen pictures of this amazing land formation, and I want to go see it for myself with my own eyes. It's called the wave. And this land formation has been made and formed through erosion, wind and rain, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Now, I've never seen the wind form this. I've not seen the rain, but I believe it's been there because I see the evidence. I see the mark that it left. So I believe it's there and just like the marks we see on this land formation, I believe that faith leaves a fingerprint. It leaves a mark. But the question is, what kind of a mark is your faith leaving? Is it leaving just one of those light indentions, light impressions that you could see, someone else might be able to see it, but they'd have to look really hard. Or is your faith leaving that deep indention that people can see around you, that your children will learn to see, that your neighbors can see, that people who come after you will be able to see? The Hebrews that had this letter written to them, they left a mark with their faith. Even though they were struggling with their faith, that life wasn't what they expected it to be, they persevered with the encouragement of this letter. And the mark that they left was for their children and for their children's children as they saw, if I, if I can persevere like my parents, then I too will have eternal life. Jennifer Rothschild is leaving an impression, a deep indention with her faith. Those who come after her who are suffering from disease or suffering um, from something that they never expected can see how she, with her own life, said, I'm not going to let this beat me and I still believe in God. She's leaving a mark with her faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, after we have this definition of faith, the author goes on to list these men and women of great faith and how the faith in their life have left a mark, have left evidence behind, evidence for us to see and be encouraged by. People like Abel, Abel who lived by faith and who learned to give the first fruits to God, That's a lesson that we still need to learn today, that the very best and the very first goes to God. People like Enoch, Enoch who lived by faith by having a daily devotion with God. That is a faith that leaves a mark, leaves evidence behind for others to see. Abraham, Abraham's faith left a mark when he stepped out in faith to leave his home in order to fulfill the purpose that God had for his life. Look at the evidence that has been left because of his faith. Moses, Moses who had faith not in his own abilities, but faith that God called him and equipped him to be a leader. That is faith. He was willing to step out knowing that God was equipping him and he led God's people to the promised land. Even Rahab, Rahab who served out of faith, willing to put her own life at risk to save God's servants. Her faith, what she was willing to do, made a mark. It left evidence. These are men and women of faith, 
men and women who confirmed their faith by the way they spoke, the way they served, and the way they stepped out in faith. The author of Hebrews calls them the ancients. He also calls them a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses who by their faith and the way they live their life witness to God's power, witness to God's faithfulness, and gives us something to look forward to, something that we can use in our own lives as we also step out in faith. But they don't just tell us about their life, they actually tell us how how we can make a mark with our own faith. In chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus. In the movie Apollo 13, it tells a story of real life um, problem that happened with the spaceship Apollo 13 when uh, it was on its way to the moon and it suffered incredible uh, mechanical failure to the point that they couldn't make it to the moon and they couldn't make it home. So they're orbiting in space and they're trying to figure out how to go home and um, the, the, um, all the machines are down, their computers, their guidance systems, everything is down. And NASA contacts them and says, okay, um, you are getting close, um, but we need you to make a manual burn. We need you to fire up the engines and you have got to correct your course because if you continue the way you're doing it, you're going right now, you are gonna skip off the atmosphere and you're gonna burn up upon reentry. So you've gotta do this, but you can't rely on anything that you expected to rely on. You can't rely on the computers or the guidance system. You're going to have to figure this out um, some other way. So the astronauts are trying to figure out, and Jim Lovell says, now wait a minute. All we need is one fixed point. Doesn't that sound familiar? Fix your eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. All we need is one fixed point, one immovable object. When things are going haywire around us, when the world is turning upside down, in order for us to have faith, all we need is to keep our eyes fixed on one point, the object of our faith. And Jesus, at the confirmation retreat, one of the most beautiful things that we do is we get to see our students and our parents get together and they get to um, choose a verse from the Bible, something that means a lot to them, something that they can stand on as a family and say, this is what we believe in. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is gonna be our family verse. And they write that verse on a canvas Today, that canvas is our altar cloth. The offering of Christ to us today is sitting on the promises that these students have confirmed is the foundation of their faith. So today, we get to reconfirm our own faith as we come to the communion table, and we get to fix our eyes on the pioneer and the perfecter, our one fixed point, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much, so much that you have given us um, your word. You have told us who you are. You have written it in your scripture and you have laid it on our hearts. We pray that today as we come to the communion table that we would um, fix our eyes on you that we would confirm our own faith 
And that no matter what is going on in our world, we would keep our eyes on you. Father, we thank you for this time and this day and this offering before us. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.